I chose to call it a swinging pendulum, but now that I think about it, it's more of a, a pendulum that got a spasm, and now it's hopefully as resolved. How, do we, how will we explain this to our future colleagues and, and med students? In the early uh, mid 80s to 90s, the PSA test was discovered and we had the seminal screening papers by Stamey and Catalona and all of a sudden the incidence rose. And then the USPSTF said, we don't have evidence, but we should probably not screen older men. Then we had the two randomized trials, uh, the European screening trial that I've been a member of for 15 years that did show a benefit, and then the US PLCO trial that did not show a benefit, which was confusing. So then in 2012, USPSDF said, screen none, we have to stop this, and the incidence plummeted. And now we're down to the pre-PSA era level, and the USPSDF has now says, screen some. So the question is, what will happen in the next few years? It'll be interesting to see. So this is how I feel, <laughs> how I feel about this. The more I think, the more confused I get about this, this pendulum swinging back and forth. So let's take a look at USPSDF. Who are they and why, why do they recommend what they do? It's an independent panel of experts and it's the most influential of guideline groups for primary care physicians in the US. And they primarily make evidence-based recommendations for the primary care setting. Uh, and like I said, it consists of volunteer experts from various disciplines, and usually they tend to not have anyone from the field on board, so they've not had a urologist on board um, for the PSA screening guidelines, for example, because they want to keep it independent. And behind every recommendation is this thorough systematic review of the evidence, and they follow the same sort of schema for all sorts of decisions. They look at the harms and the benefits and so on and so forth. And then finally, they come up with a recommendation, either it's A or B, which is recommend the service, or it's a C in this case, which is the shared decision making. D is recommending against, and I is when there is insufficient evidence. And the test that we talk about here is, of course, the blood test PSA testing. And like I said, the incidence um, rose after the discovery of, of this test. But also, prostate cancer mortality is down by 51% in the US, which is mainly explained by screening. We have also evidence from both the US and the European trial that screening reduces mortality. We talked a lot about in the, the previous talk about the benefits and harms of, of screening, and this is why the USPSDF has been skeptical to introducing population-based screening, because they feel that the harms do not outweigh the benefits. And mainly this is because of the side effects from treatment that have an impact on men's quality of life. So in 2008, they said we don't have evidence because we didn't have the results of our randomized trials, but they said we probably shouldn't screen older men. But then in 2012, they said, stop this. You have to, to stop screening uh, everyone, and which was a, a, a major decision. And we can understand why the USPSDF said no, because I would say that screening in this country has been a public health disaster. And what do I mean by that? What has been wrong with the way that screening and treatment has been practiced? Well, first of all, one in four primary care physicians, they order the test without discussing it with the patient. It's just part of an annual uh, exam and people don't know about it. Some might get upset that they didn't want to have it drawn. So uh, that's one thing, you know, we say we should do shared decision making, but it's not happening. We also know that there's been excessive screening of elderly men. So we've, we've been more likely to screen the man to the right than the man to the left, which doesn't really make any sense. We have screened men who have been dying from other cancers. Why are we screening sick, uh, uh, unhealthy men who might not even benefit from the test? We also know that most men will develop prostate cancer if they live long enough. We know that from autopsy studies and therefore we're likely to detect a lot of tumors that we wouldn't have needed to detect. We've had two liberal criteria for biopsy. We've been biopsying to the right and to the left. And as you know, the PSA test has a very low specificity. Most men with an elevated PSA do not have cancer, but a benign condition causing the elevation. And we know from the study by my colleague, Dr. Eastam, that the PSA level has a tendency to fluctuate. Here's the study that he did in, in the study of men for, followed for colon polyps and measured the PSA test um, over, year, over time. 
and saw that over years, if you measure PSA over five years, you see this tendency of the PSA to fluctuate. So if we immediately jump to biopsy, there will be a lot of unnecessary biopsies just based on one elevated PSA test. And like we talked about before, the risk of hospitalizations for infectious complications uh, have been increased in, in the recent years, and so we are biopsying men without compelling reasons. We have also been over-treating um, low-risk prostate cancer. Here you can see the results from the U.S. Um, capture database showing that the rate of active surveillance has only been as low as 10 percent over the past two decades, and it's not only until recently that this rate has been increasing. And we know that the risk of dying from localized prostate cancer is very low, so there's been a tremendous overdiagnosis and overtreatment. Another important problem is that this treatment has largely been administered by low volume providers. Uh, does anyone know the typical uh, annual radical prostatectomy rate for a typical U.S. surgeon? In, this was in 2005. Three? 18? 12 to 18? 100? So Dr. Crawford has seen these slides before, the number is three. And if you put this in perspective, we know that there's something called the learning curve. And it takes about 250 cases before a surgeon can really master the procedure. So this is problematic because we know that large or high volume surgeons have better outcomes, both when it comes to oncologic outcomes, but also functional outcomes, so impotence and incontinence. So whose hand performs the radical prostatectomy can have a significant uh, impact on outcomes. So if you're a patient, you can ask your surgeon, what are your outcomes? How many have you done? So putting this all in perspective, we can understand why the US PSGF said no. We have to, we have to stop this the way that we've been doing it. However, that said, we wrote this uh, critique because the, the evidence review behind this contained a lot of errors of facts and statistics and interpretations by the US PSGF. So for instance, they drew a conclusion based on incomplete data. So at the time, the European study was still ongoing. We had just about 10 years of follow-up. And as you know, prostate cancer is slow growing. And if you base conclusions based on interim data, there is not really sufficient evidence. They also failed to address the time to event nature of, of the European uh, trial data. And as you all know, the, the mortality benefit uh, increases with time and also the number needed to screen and the number needed to, to diagnose and treat to avoid one prostate cancer death. So this number continues to decrease uh, year after year. They also always like to focus on overall mortality, which I don't really understand because this is a screening trial, it's not a treatment trial. So it has very low power to, we have low power to detect a reduction in mortality, in overall mortality, because prostate cancer is such a small proportion of overall deaths. So there's simply too much noise. And also they just pooled all the screening trials together, and which is not feasible either because they're so different and a lot of them had methodological weaknesses. So the AUA, of course, in 2012 was very disappointed. The, the former president said that the US PSTF is doing great disservice to men worldwide who might benefit from the test. And I still remember this AUA meeting. It was, it was a very strange feeling. Everyone walked around like super serious and, oh, did you hear the US PSTF? So, um, but maybe we needed that slap in the face. Maybe we needed a change for something to happen. So my student, Catherine Fleschner, she's the daughter of Neil Fleschner, who's a urologist in Toronto. She came to me one summer and she wanted to do a research project. And I said, why don't we look at everything that happened after the US PSGF? And she wrote this beautiful review and she's now in medical school. I think um, she, she's too smart to become a urologist. She'll probably become a medical oncologist, but uh, she's, she's, doing, ooh, she's doing great work. Um, uh, so this is her review, and she outlined everything that, that happened. And we noticed that the PSA testing rates have declined in all age groups. Uh, the incidence has declined in all age groups. We're now down to the pre-PSA era level. It's declined in all races, black and white. We see that the rates of biopsy have also declined, and we now see a stage and grade shift of tumors being at higher grade and stage upon detection. So what are, we do <laughs> what are we doing? What do we do when we said stop PSA testing? We have a, a very good test, but now we say we shouldn't use it. So the question is, if we were to just stop PSA testing, the risk is that we might see 
uh, these cases, uh, again, going, going back to the pre-PSA era uh, scenarios, when we, men come in with urinary retention, they come in with bone metastases and even spinal cord compression. And these have been very rare scenarios, but now they're starting to come back again. And we've shown in our screening trial that screening reduces, of course, the risk of metastatic disease and mortality. So if we were to stop PSA testing, the number of men presenting with metastatic disease would be three times greater. This is what it looked like before the PSA and was discovered and after the PSA, and this might come back again. So if you put this um, in a model, you can see that discontinuing screening would lead to a failure to prevent 50,000 men from dying from prostate cancer over this period. So that, that is it's a big risk. So therefore, the USPSDF said, okay, wait a minute, may, let us think again. And this year, earlier this year, they made the final recommendation that, okay, we shouldn't stop this altogether, but we should do shared decision making. And they recommend this for men 55 to 69, which is the core age group in the European screening trial. And this is really a sea change that puts USPSDF into mainstream academic thought, and they are now in line with all other guideline groups. They still have the mo more conservative age range, but they are now still they are now together with everyone. So, what tipped the scale? What made them change their minds from from stopping screening to recommending shared decision making? Well, there was a lot of critique. We critiqued, others critiqued. They solicited input from urologists um, this time, so they weren't completely independent anymore. We had longer follow-up from the European screening trial. There was also longer follow-up from the PIVOT trial. And there was this notice of the increase in, in the uptake of active surveillance, which mitigates the side effects of overdiagnosis. And also, the USPSDF this time around did not attempt to adjust down the mortality benefit from the PLCO trial. before. We have always talked about the, the PLCO as a negative trial and the ERSPC as a positive trial, but the problem, as shown in this study that came out, was that almost everyone in the PLCO got a PSA test in both the screening arm and the control arm, so it was very difficult to show a difference in mortality between the two trial arms because everyone was screened. So in summary, we applaud the new position of the USPSTF, but we think we can still do better. The age range is still pretty rigid. They still exclude the, the Göteborg trial they have been a part of for many years. Uh, they ignore the level one evidence from starting at 50 as opposed to 55. They ignore all the evidence of screening benefit of younger men, 45 to 50. They exclude all studies on uh, observational studies on the benefits of using a baseline PSA. But for harms, they include both randomized trials and observational studies, studies, which doesn't make any sense. And they also use a lot of outdated references. The time horizon is still short because the European trial only has 13 years of follow-up so far. But we have modeling studies that project outcomes on a lifetime horizon, but they d simply don't consider those as high-level evidence. And they, they're excluded from the review. It also says in the report that one investigator abstracted the study data, and I feel sorry for this investigator because this is really an, a big challenge because of the massive volume of research published in the field, and if you're not a urologist or oncologist or in this field, this, this is really a major task. And we've talked a lot about this. Um, the recommendation is now a C, shared decision making, and will primary care physicians have time to do, and what should they say? And also, this is the USPSDF's um, uh, infographic or decision aid. Um, I would question some of the numbers in, in this um, decision aid. For instance, they say for every thousand men, you will have one death avoided. But if you look over a lifetime horizon, that goes down to about one in a hundred or nine in a thousand instead. So it's a much, much um, bigger benefit over a lifetime. And also, if my colleagues had 50% erectile dysfunction and 15% urinary incontinence rate, I don't think they, they would come to work tomorrow. So you can question some of these, these estimates in, in this infographic. So um, in summary, we could have uh, had organized screening. Why didn't the USPSGF give this an A or a B recommendation? Uh, we could have said yes to creating some sort of order, but instead we say no, carry on with this chaos that is currently ongoing. So instead of thinking, we put our hand, head in the sand and we just continue as usual. But we don't have to stop the PSA test. 
uh, or PSA screening when we can actually stop this from occurring. And in my next talk, I'll talk about the five golden rules of how we can screen smarter so we can keep the benefits and reduce the harms. And it's simply get, get consent, don't screen men who won't benefit, don't biopsy if you don't have a reason, don't treat low risk disease, and if you have to treat, refer men to a high volume provider. To be continued. <laughs>